Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we spend some time reflecting on your word now, as we read it and meditate on it, and not only think about it as something in the past, but something is absolutely relevant for today and our futures, I pray that you would speak loudly and clearly to us about who we are and who you've called us to be. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you were here with us last week, we were talking about new beginnings that we started eight months ago in Genesis, and we've been working our way through the Bible, and we find ourselves now in the book of Acts. And we talked about what happens next. As we went through Easter, we saw the cross, we saw the empty tomb, but what happens next? And we talked about the excitement of a new beginning, that God does something new, and we have it up on our green banner here. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And we talked about the excitement of a new beginning, that even though there's some fear and anxiety, there's also often this thought of like, oh, this is so exciting. It's a new adventure, a new road, a new journey, a new discovery. There's something new coming up ahead. But the, the new beginning actually isn't the goal or the point. Last week we were really focusing on the new beginning, but it's not actually the goal or the point. Here's an example. Imagine that you decide that you want to lose some weight. And you go to Weight Watchers and you sign up and you leave with your bag or box full of new meals that you're going to eat. Was that the goal? To sign up? No, the goal wasn't just to sign up. The, the goal is that you have a, some, a goal in mind, something down the road. Or, or think about you decide you want to get in shape and be more fit and have biceps like mine. And you decide, I'm going to go to the gym and start working out. So you go get your gym membership and you can wave that around and say, all right, I've done it. Well, no, that wasn't the goal. That, that's just the beginning, right? That's just the first thing. Or imagine you decide that you want to start buying a toilet paper, 500 rolls at a time. So you get a Costco membership. Holding the membership isn't the goal. The goal is those 500 rolls of toilet paper. Often as we talk about Christianity, we talk about this new beginning. If you would just become a Christian, if you would just say this prayer, if you would just get baptized, then everything would be, everything would be perfect for you. Then you would stand up taller. Your hair would be thicker. Your teeth would be whiter. Your bank account fuller. All these are great things, but the beginning isn't actually the point or the goal. It's absolutely necessary, but it's not the goal. It's interesting, though, that we would say, well, then it must be heaven. But I would say this morning that heaven actually isn't the goal either. And this is why I say that, because if, if heaven is the goal, what do you have to do to reach that goal? Not believe, right? So at the start of your beginning, you've also reached the end goal because God tells us, he promises us that if you believe, you will be saved. So the moment you were baptized, you could say, phew, I'm done. What a life this was. This was great. Take me now, right? I mean, it's, we'd be missing this whole thing in the middle called life. Right? We miss this whole thing in the middle. And sometimes we tell people as they're coming to faith, this is going to be so great because if you become a Christian, then you get to go to heaven. And that's absolutely true. But it misses this whole thing called life. And so what I want to talk about this morning is that the goal isn't actually the new beginning. And the goal actually isn't heaven. The goal reveals itself and the goal is there in the midst of the journey, the Christian life. Have any of you read the Lord of the Rings books or watched the Lord of the Rings movies? Have you watched these? Okay. If you haven't, let me just ruin it a bit for you. Even if you have, I'll ruin it a bit probably. Think about those movies, okay? The, here's the premise. This guy, this little guy named Frodo is given a treasure, a ring, and he has to take it from his home all the way to this place far, far away. And so the, at the beginning of that new beginning, there's some excitement, there's some uncertainty and anxiety, but excitement. And then his friend, Sam, signs up to go on the journey with him. They're like, well, this is great. We're going to go together. We're going to bring this treasure down the road, and this will be so great. And then some more friends join along, and then they're like, well, this is absolutely, it's like we're off to Disneyland. Like, this is good times. <laughs> and it's all good. And then after that, that takes about 10 minutes of the movie, okay, all of that part. The next nine hours of the movie, they're just flailing around. Somebody save us. We're getting shot. We don't know where we're going. There's bad guys chasing us. We're all sick and hungry. We're all dying. That's for nine hours. Then they get to the destination, and everyone lives happily ever after. The point of 
the Lord of the Rings series isn't actually the beginning, and it really isn't the end. And I say that because if the point was the beginning, you'd think they'd spend an hour or two hours on the beginning, but they don't. And if the point was the end, the happily ever after, that's where you'd focus all your attention. But that's not where they spend it either. They spend all this time, the nine hours in the middle, on the journey. And I think that's so true of the Christian life as well. If you read through the Bible, what you find is that it's not all about the new beginning, and it's not all about heaven. It's not a book all about heaven. It's a book about this journey as we walk with God. What's the Christian life like? What's the Christian life all about? What's the point and the mission of the Christian life? As we've traveled to the Bible, maybe you've seen, I hope that you've seen that the Old Testament is really about this nation, this new beginning God creates with a purpose that they fall short of, but a purpose of sharing the message of God and a relationship with God with the world around them. That's why God raises up this nation. They're blessed to be a blessing. They're blessed to reach out. They're blessed to bring people in to a relationship with God. Then Jesus comes And Jesus tells us his mission is to seek and to save the lost. Jesus didn't come because he wanted a new beginning. He wasn't in heaven talking with his dad, and he's like, I'm kind of bored. I would like to do something different for a while. I've never been crucified before, right? I want to do all these things. The point for Jesus wasn't the new beginning, and the point wasn't getting to heaven. He was already in heaven. The point was this mission to go and reach out and to finish in a way that mission that Israel failed in, right? He comes and lives a perfect life, dies on a cross, rises from the grave to make a relationship with God possible. And then as we get into the New Testament, we see that same mission carry forward, that the mission of sharing this gospel, this good news message is handed over to Paul and the apostles, and then they're supposed to go out and share it. And I want to read through a passage with you that I think kind of brings out the highs and lows of that journey. And I've put in some cues for you, because often as we read the Bible, read about something, it could be something incredibly dramatic or fantastic, but we just keep going on to the next sentence, on to the next and we just kind of read it like we're reading a textbook, but that's not how, I think it's supposed to invoke a response from us. And so I've put in your responses, your cues, and we're going to put that up on the screen now. Can you see your part? I made it big. That's how I want the response to be, okay? Let's try this together. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. That was good. That was good. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So... Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. You should try this at home when you're just reading the Bible alone, right? Wouldn't that be fantastic? Or at work, if you're just doing a quick Devo? Woo! I think, what's going on? Okay, let's keep going. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derb and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He'd been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet! At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that what, the, what Paul had done, they shouted in the Laconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won over the crowd. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derb. 
They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. It's interesting. Thank you for doing that. Doesn't that kind of bring a bit more life to it as you're reading? I mean, it's just kind of great to have the, oh, this is bad news. Oh, this is really good news. Oh, this is a curious or, or a wonderment for us. Do you ever read that, though, and think, why does Paul go through all of that? I mean, what's the point? I mean, it sounds awful, doesn't it? We go and preach, and a huge group of people believed. Then some of them took us outside of the city and stoned us, leaving us for dead. Then I got up, and I went and preached there some more. Then they told me they were going to stone me again, so then I snuck away. Then I get arrested. Why does Paul go through all of that if the point was the new beginning or if the point was heaven? Because he's already got both, right? The moment you believe... That new beginning has started and also completed. Heaven is already yours. It's already promised. It's already this guarantee that you've been sealed with in Christ. What's the point? Well, the point is to carry this message out. First to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. Do you know why any of you believe in God? It's because these apostles were faithful to that mission. Otherwise, you would never have heard of it. Right? It would just be this little faith that died in Israel, died in Jerusalem, because no one would have spread it. Jesus rose from the grave. His disciples were very excited about it. They told no one, and it ended. But you've heard, because someone took that torch of faith, that message of faith, and kept on passing it along. Jesus built on what Israel had been given to share. The disciples took what Jesus did and accomplished and shared it with other people. And it's been shared and handed down and handed down and handed down and handed down. And now it's in your hands and in my hands. Now it's been given to us and trusted to us. And the point isn't that we got baptized. And the point isn't that we got heaven. But the point now, the goal is in this journey of carrying it, faithfully carrying it to the world around us so that they can have a new beginning and so that they can also receive the gift of eternal life. Just keep faithfully passing that on and carrying it along. There's a boy who was asked by his Sunday school teacher why it's important for us to be quiet in church. And the boy said, it's because everyone's sleeping. (laughs) Church, I, I wonder sometimes if the church in North America isn't sleeping. Have we fallen asleep with this mission that we've been given? Have we received it? and pull it in close like a blanket that makes us feel good, and then falling asleep on the job. Jesus told his disciples, therefore, go. Uh, go to all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Go to all these different places, and now we've got it here, but we need to keep on going with it out. That keeps carrying out. And we talked a bit about that last week, about sharing the gospel, and someone talked to me afterwards and said, Pastor Ian, I've tried. I've tried and tried and tried. And he said that my scorecard, he said, I'm keeping a scorecard and right now I'm at zero for all my efforts. I don't feel like I've seen any positive growth. And I'm excited that over Easter, we saw so many of you invite people. I'm excited that uh, as we give you postcards or things to hand out and send out, that many of you are doing that. And so for those of you who are doing that, I want to encourage you as you share the gospel, as you take this mission and this message that's been given to us, and as you share that with the world. And so I just want to talk about some encouragements because as we do what God has called us to do, we'll be like Paul and experience struggle and setback and hardship. In this life, Jesus tells us, you will have trouble. And so I want to encourage you as you live out and embody that mission to share the gospel. And These verses are going to be up on the screen uh, for us to read. I think there's another slide. That's right. Praise be to God the Father. This is from 2 Corinthians Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. I just want to point out a few things if we go back to that screen. I just love the the realness of the gospel. And as Paul writes, he tells us, the first thing he tells us, there is going to be trouble. 
There's going to be trouble whether you're a Christian or not. There's going to be trouble in life. There's going to be those mountaintop victories and highs, but there's also going to be some lows that you walk through, some valleys and darkness and painful situations you walk through. So first of all, he says, there's going to be trouble. Secondly, the God of all comfort will comfort you. God doesn't just comfort you in some areas. He doesn't just comfort you when you have a spiritual challenge, but God's desire is to comfort you in all things. You fail an exam, God wants to be there to comfort you. You struggle in a relationship, God wants to comfort you. You have a flat tire on the side of the highway, God wants to comfort you. In all those situations of life, God, the God of all comfort, wants to comfort (laughs) you. And he does that because he loves you, but he also does that to equip you so that you can comfort others. Now, that's the third thing I see in this passage. The God of all comfort comforts you and sends you out so that you can comfort others. Sometimes when people come and talk to me, I cannot relate at all to what they're sharing. I can say, I can only imagine how difficult that can be, or I'm so sorry for that situation, but I've never been through that situation. Other times, someone comes to me and I can say, I've been through something so similar, And I feel like I'm able to comfort them to a deeper and a greater level because there's this understanding of, oh yeah, we've we've walked this road. We've walked this journey together. Church, whatever God has carried you through and comforted you through, he's done that because he loves you. But in that, he's also equipped you to go and comfort others. You know, I heard this happen. And when that happened to me, it was really helpful when someone did this. Or when that happened to me, uh, what I really needed was this. And just to partner with those people. That, that's, that's the mission of the gospel, isn't it? To go alongside those people and to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. That we would partner with one another. Our relationships as a church would be a, almost infinitely greater if we would learn to do that better to walk alongside, to partner better, to rejoice and mourn with one another and comfort each other. Let's go to the next slide. It says this. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We are under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. You know, like in this passage, it got that bad. Paul's saying, it got so bad, we felt like we were under a death sentence. It got so bad, they dragged me out and left me for dead. It got so bad, there was no way out. And then he says, but we know the God who raises the dead. If you ever feel like you've been that far, that hopeless, that lost, Paul says to you, it's okay. Jesus can raise the dead. This same Jesus who lived for you and died on a cross for you and rose from the grave, he also has raised others from the grave. And either he will raise you after you've died or he'll rescue you from that situation again and again and again and again. No matter what situation you're in, Paul says, this is going to be okay as you cling to the God who knows how to raise the dead. He keeps going. There's one more screen, I think. Let's go to the next one. Oh, no, this is the one. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. As you help us by your prayers. Paul says, you want to help me? Start praying. Not, not a one second, oh, yeah, I said I'd pray for them. God help so-and-so. Let's, like, let's really rally in prayer. Wouldn't it be great if people walked in here and said, man, this is a place, a house of prayer. If that was just tangible here. Sometimes people will ask me to pray for them after church, and I get home and think, oh yeah, who said what? I said I'd pray about what? And then if I can remember them, I'm going to say, please be with Ron and all of his issues. Because I don't remember what the issue is sometimes. It's just, when we say we're going to pray, we should, be, we should like say, ah, let's do that right now because I don't want to forget. Or let's, let's gather 10 people right now and pray about this. Let's earnestly pray. Why? So that as, uh, then all those people can celebrate that God has answered the prayers of many. As you go through life, as you go through this Christian journey with this mission to pass on to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to your children and your grandchildren to pass on this message of the gospel of forgiveness and life, you're going to hit road bumps because often life is hard, but God is good. I 
pray that you're encouraged by these words, knowing that there'll be trouble, but God is the God of all comfort in every situation. And that as he comforts you, he also equips you to comfort others. And that even if you reach that point of death, that that's okay, because Jesus beat death. And that you would rally people around you to pray, and that you'd be quick to pray for others around you. Uh, I read this thing this week, and I've heard it before, but it was just a good reminder that the Christian faith isn't, or the Christian church isn't a cruise ship. It's a rescue boat. And that God sends us out to draw other people in, to rescue other people in their struggle and in their challenges. Church, as we carry this message forward, let me close with this, that God has given you a new beginning. And God offers you as many new beginnings as you need. And that God also in that new beginning of faith has promised you eternity with him. In that middle point, until then, God has chosen you to go where only you are, uh, to only those people you know, to only those places you can reach with the comfort that he's given you. And he sends you out with his Holy Spirit, the only gift that you need. That's why Jesus came and lived for you and died for you and rose again for you to give you that promise. And now he sends you out to share it with the world around you. I hope that as you think of that, it brings you incredible hope and comfort and peace, knowing that the hands that were nailed to the cross are the hands that are carrying you home. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, and as we have looked a little bit at the mission that you've given to your people, God, there's so much more that we could talk about, but I think most of us here know that we've been given that mission. And I think most of us here have probably hit roadblocks as we've tried to do that, whether that's been roadblocks we've created, or maybe they're just roadblocks we've imagined, or maybe they're roadblocks that have been real and tangible as we've experienced suffering or hurt. God, I think that each person here has likely also experienced your comfort and compassion. God, we thank you for that, that you're such a loving God, that you care to comfort us in all of our troubles. And that you, in doing that, have equipped us to comfort those around us. And that you send us out with this incredible promise that even at the point of death, that there's this incredible comfort of knowing that you've beaten death and you can raise the dead. God, as we carry this mission, we pray that it would be effective, as you've promised that it would be. And God, I pray that we would become people even more so of prayer, people who are quick to pray, people who know that the prayers of the righteous avail much, that we'd be able to celebrate and share what prayer has accomplished as you've been at work in our lives. God, for all those people we know who are far from you or who do not know you yet, we pray that, uh, that this would be the year, that, that this would be the month, Maybe that this would be the day that they come to know you in a way that gives them a new beginning and a new and certain hope. God, we pray that you'd be with all those families who are part of our congregation, all those families who are part of our school, all those families that are part of our manor, for all those families who come and go through this building, whether that's for the food bank or for girl guides or for hockey nights or anything else. We pray for the congregations that worship here, for the Russian and Korean churches who worship here. God, may we be united in this mission as we share the gospel. We pray for this. We pray for the ministry of Stand and for pregnancies options, asking that they would see incredible fruit from their work, that they would see lives transformed and lives saved, and that they would have a powerful impact in our community. God, for everything else in our hearts and minds today, we commit all these things to you, trusting in your son Jesus who taught us to pray.